Cool. Back in my day, the name Ubisoft used to mean something. It meant Rayman, Prince of Persia, Beyond Good and Evil, and Splinter Cell. Now you see this logo, and all you think of is Far Cry 11 and a launcher that spies on you in the shower. Without sounding poncy about it, I think it's fair to say that Ubisoft doesn't make games for people like me. I generally don't like checklist heavy open world games, so I haven't played a Ubisoft title in over a decade, or any of the Assassin's Creed games. Since the original's release in 2007, there have been 13 mainline entries, and before this video is over, I'm sure there'll be a couple more. Even to an outside observer like myself, it's clear that the series has become a bit of an assembly line product, similar to yearly sports releases or the Call of Duty games. But just like Call of Duty, it all had to start somewhere. I'm sure the team behind the original COD were filled with a lot of excitement for the game they were making. They had a vision of a standout game they wanted to play for themselves, so they poured their hearts into making it a reality. And considering Ubisoft's track record of excellent games from the early 2000s, I'm sure it's a similar story of exciting new ideas and creative passion for the team that developed the original Assassin's Creed. With all that in mind, I wanted to take a look at Assassin's Creed in a vacuum, to judge it on its own merits with an open mind, and see if there was something special there that I missed back in the day. I'll be reviewing the PC Director's Cut, which came out one year after the original console release and adds some extra mission types for the investigations. And in true Ubisoft fashion, this version suffers from constant hitching as it tries to contact a telemetry server that no longer exists. This even happens to the GOG version, despite all those promises of being DRM free. Not off to a great start, but there's some easy workarounds to fix this, or you can just switch off your network like I did. You of course play as Desmond Nolan North Miles. I'm a bartender for Christ's sakes! What do you want me to do, teach you how to mix a martini? A young guy kidnapped by a mysterious pharmaceutical company and held hostage as he's forced to relive the genetic memories of his ancestor inside a machine called the Animus. After a little modern day exposition, the game dunks you right into the heart of its third crusade setting, where you assume the role of Altair, a young Middle Eastern assassin wrapped up in a conflict with the Knights Templar. Right away, the quality of this setting practically smacks you in the face, and ultimately it stands out as one of Assassin's Creed's greatest strengths. Ubisoft have crafted an incredibly immersive setting here, and I appreciate that you're dunked right into the conflict and politics of this world without any kind of patronizing history lesson. I won't be commenting on the nitty gritty of its historical accuracy, mostly because my knowledge of the period largely stems from Kingdom of Heaven and Stronghold Crusader for Windows XP. It's all sci-fi historical fiction at the end of the day anyway, but regardless I think Ubisoft have done a wicked job of creating such a fleshed out stage for the events of their game. Altair speaking in a flat American accent might take you out of it a bit, but we'll get to him later. An excellent kill. Fortune favors your blade. Not fortune, skill. Watch a while longer and you might learn something. For a relatively early 7th gen game, the visuals and tech powering this ambitious world hold up nicely. The three cities of Jerusalem, Damascus, and Acre are dense with multiple NPC types and feel alive in a way that represents a true generational leap from the open world games of the PlayStation 2. Guards gang up on peasants, European Crusader Knights chew the fat in their native tongues, street preachers shout Holy Land politics, scholars potter the streets, and beggars hassle Altair for his hard-earned pocket money. It all does a wonderful job of immersing you, despite the lack of any meaningful NPC interactions or compelling side content. The PC version scales handsomely into modern resolutions too, while only amplifying a few ugly nose hairs along the way. The obscene amount of pop-in while traveling is hard to ignore, and goofy pedestrian models might take you out of it here and there. Regardless, it's all very impressive stuff for 2007, especially considering the scale of its open world. While I never played this for myself back in the day, it's one of those games I saw at a friend's house on a big CRT that made me feel like a real numbnuts for buying a Wii instead. Early in its development, Assassin's Creed was envisioned as a next-gen spin-off to the Prince of Persia series, which would take the acrobatic platforming of the Sands of Time and place it into a more action-oriented open-world setting featuring a band of assassins protecting the young prince. While the Prince of Persia connection was eventually chucked out, the assassin concept stayed, and so did the idea of doing mad parkour around an open world. If you've played any of those 6th gen Prince of Persia games, then steering Altair around should provide a small twinge of familiarity. 
Despite the advances in motion capture and animation, the movement of Assassin's Creed isn't the big leap forward for video game gymnastics that you might expect it to be. It's more like a hop, skip and a scramble into a new direction that demands a lot less of the player than our favourite snooty prince once did. Hold the right trigger and A button together, and Altair will parkour his way around the environment without much brain power needed from the player. Jumping, upward climbing and sprinting are all covered under the umbrella of this button combo. And all the game really asks of you is an analogue stick direction and the ability to pass which surfaces can be parkoured across. It's a decently slick system which allows even the most casual of players to monkey man their way around the environment and look cool while doing it. But the penalty for this level of accessibility is that rotten little feeling that the game is sometimes playing itself. When that automated sense of control kicks into gear, I often found myself longing for the more involved and puzzle-like movement of the prince. And while I love the challenging platforming of those games, I don't think the choice to greatly simplify things for Assassin's Creed was entirely motivated by the desire to accommodate casual players. Platforming in the sands of time works so wonderfully because every room and set piece is a linear obstacle course filled with very gamey looking traps and hazards. A sense of reality clearly wasn't the focus here, they're just pretty environments that serve as a stage for exciting action. Assassin's Creed instead carries the heavy burden of being a realistic open world game that can't get away with cartoonish movements or abstract environments. If Altair moved with the stiff precision of early Lara Croft, or the methodical acrobatics of the prince, then basic actions like losing guards in a chase, or quickly scaling across buildings, would become very clumsy and frustrating because the realistic level design would stand at odds with such a demanding control scheme. The compromise that Ubisoft arrived at is to scatter the game with little steps, bars, parapets and other platforms that effectively mesh with the urban environment, and instead of asking players to carefully line up their jumps, it's settled on a system where the analogue stick and camera work in tandem to fluidly chain movements together without requiring timed inputs from the player. It's a shame they couldn't find a more challenging middle ground, but it's hard to be too hung up on that considering how well the system works inside a very multifaceted game like Assassin's Creed. Though in those rare instances where the controls go completely arse over tit for no reason, you might wish Altair had his own dagger of time. While it's entirely optional and won't make or break the speed of your movement through the game world, Assassin's Creed hides a fairly large amount of little tricks and secret animations to its parkour. It's not necessary to engage with any of this to competently hop around, but I think it's nice that such a treasure trove of movements lurk beneath the surface. Techniques like vaulting or side ejects provide a cool way for more involved players to express themselves beyond Altair's regular free running. While the man himself had nothing to do with Assassin's Creed, it feels like the spirit of Jordan Mechner lives on within the minutia of all these animations. And that goes for the combat too. Of all the little moving parts that make up Assassin's Creed, the one I was most surprised to find so enjoyable was the combat. Just like the parkour, it's very easy to trace the combat's lineage back to the sands of time. Altair is far less nimble than the Prince, and gone are the button combos of Warrior Within, but both games feature a heavy emphasis on crowd control sword fighting with precise counterattacks. Though unlike Prince of Persia's combat, which gradually becomes more and more of a giant pain in the ass, I quite enjoy the sword fighting in Assassin's Creed. It's not very deep or demanding, but the large amount of brutal execution animations and the small thrills of pulling off a counter attack or breaking an enemy's grab keep the combat enjoyable throughout. There's plenty of room for improvement and expansion, but for a game where combat isn't the focus, I'd say it's a big improvement over the sands of time. After totally ballsing up an important mission against the Templars, Altair gets the Metroid Prime treatment, as he's stripped of his abilities and gear and sent to do the dirty work of killing nine mysterious targets across the Holy Land. It's here where Assassin's Creed sinks into the rhythm it'll be following for the rest of the game, and where its biggest cracks begin to show. Travel to a city, talk to the local assassin, scale some towers to uncover your investigation missions, smash out the investigation missions, talk to your buddy again, do the assassination, talk to your buddy again, head back home to get your new mission, rinse and repeat nine more times for the rest of the game. It's capital R repetitive, and during my playthrough, I twice found myself having to take a multi-day break because I felt my sanity slipping a bit. Although in retrospect, I think this mental crack up was partly my own fault too. 
When I first started Assassin's Creed, I had this idea that I was going to do every investigation mission on offer. I wanted to get a full picture of the game, and I thought it would be irresponsible if I only did the bare minimum. But sometime around the fourth target, the sheer pointlessness of all this padding and busy work really began to sink in, and the thought of repeating it for several more hours made me go a little funny. And that's not even mentioning the stupid shit I didn't bother with, like collecting 400 flags as if this was some bizarre Arabian version of Donkey Kong 64. From a gameplay perspective, the original eavesdropping, pickpocketing, and interrogation missions found in the console version are easily the worst of the bunch. You can practically do some of these with your eyes closed. I wanted to take the game as seriously as possible and really get into the mindset of an assassin doing his investigations. But my patience for listening to recycled goons, paid off street preachers, and corrupt officials quickly wore thin, and eventually I found myself struggling to care about the context they were providing to an upcoming assassination. The extra mission types introduced in the director's cut have a bit more challenge, but their rewards typically feel hollow. Occasionally you'll get a little letter with some extra backstory, but more often than not, your copy-pasted quest giver will only give you a map of guard positions or laughably obvious advice like, try entering from the roof. I think it says a lot about Ubisoft's confidence in these missions that you're only ever expected to do two or three out of a possible six. They knew it was crap, they knew the players would think it was crap, and this is their way of softening the blow without having to rethink the game's core structure. And regardless of which missions are completed or what Altair uncovers, he'll always return to the Assassin's Hideout with the full picture anyway. Having to climb multiple towers just to uncover these missions is a real drag too. Lovely views, but getting to the top rarely involves anything more than holding two buttons and pushing forward on the analog stick. These towers are the one section of the game where Ubisoft really should have pushed the difficulty of the climbing and platforming. Isolated from the rest of the game world, climbing one or two huge towers could have served as a nice challenging puzzle that put the player's skills to the test. Instead, they're forced to climb a bucket load of smaller ones that can basically be done on autopilot. There's a couple of good climbs in there, like scaling the enormous church in Acre, but those are the exceptions to an otherwise mind-numbing amount of padding. The investigation format and the way it was done is my biggest disappointment with Assassin's Creed. The missions are dull, and the information Altair works to get ultimately has very little bearing on how an assassination will play out. At best, you'll be told your target might head back to a different area, or given a moment when they'll be most vulnerable, but it's never anything you couldn't have easily figured out on your own during the assassination. There's a real missed opportunity here to do something similar to the Hitman series. What if Altair's missions gave him genuinely valuable information or tools to pull off the perfect unseen assassination? The more investigations you do, the more flawless and covert the kill finally becomes. Even if no improvements were made to the missions themselves, players would be more motivated to complete them all rather than just slogging through the bare minimum. The devious creativity shown off in a game like Hitman Blood Money could have worked so beautifully here. But there's no poisonings, fatal accidents, costume changes, or anything fun like that on offer here. Just Altair, his blade, and a big bale of hay. And as far as assassins go, Altair isn't the smoothest of operators either. I really dislike how some assassinations practically force you into creating a big commotion, while others can be done quietly with a quick getaway. For those kills where causing a scene is unavoidable, it just makes Altair seem like a bad assassin, which by extension makes you feel like a bad player. The best you can hope for in missions like these is a quick getaway, and in a game all about planning and pulling off assassinations, well, that's a pretty big hair in the soup. On the bright side, the targets themselves and the cutscenes leading up to their death are usually quite engaging and memorable. My favourites of the bunch include the merchant king who poisons his party, the French doctor experimenting on his patients, the book-burning scholar, and the Templar Knight wigging out because he knows Altair is coming to get him. Most of these assassinations involve some sort of moral quandary for both Altair and the player to think through. Should free information be restricted for the sake of social cohesion? Should doctors perform unethical experiments if it means more lives saved in the future? Is tyranny justified for the benefit of a safer society? It's nothing especially noodle-scratching, but it's enough to give the Templars an interesting air of moral ambiguity and for Altair to begin questioning the hypocrisies of his own order. After creating so much chaos himself, 
Altair's platitudes on morality become more hollow with each kill, feeding the growing disillusionment between him and his master, and forcing him to look inwards for the right answers. Spoilers from here on in. I really wasn't expecting to enjoy the game's story or Altair as a character as much as I did. As repetitive as the game is, the hit list format provides a nice framework for us to see Altair develop. It's gratifying to watch him grow from an impulsive, zealous blockhead into a more mature, but also deeply conflicted individual. Having his corrupted master serve as the game's final kill was an awesome way to put a cap on Altair's development and the bigger themes of the narrative. The self-righteous puppet master who played both sides while preaching the benefits of free will is gone, and in his wake, there's a chance to reform the Order. al Mualim violently controlling everyone around him, even for the sake of eventual peace, was a clear violation of the freedom the assassins fight for. But in the face of overwhelming odds, Altair is left wondering whether or not his master's ends justified the means. You know, it's not Shakespeare, but for a big budget action game it's enjoyable stuff. Another highlight was the relationship between Altair and Malik. Altair's recklessness cost Malik his brother, and his arm. Watching the pair slowly squash their beef and come to respect one another was a nice slow burn that really brought a smile to my face towards the end. The only awkward dent in all of this is Altair's American accent. Best hurry. No doubt you're eager to put your tongue to his boot. Another word and I'll put my blade to your throat. I get that this was probably done to make him more accessible for a global audience, but when every other character in the game has a thick Middle Eastern, French or British accent, Altair sticks out like a sore thumb, a clear violation of the Assassin's Creed. The game's explanation for why everyone speaks English is that the Animus is translating everything for Desmond's brain, and we're left to assume that this is why Altair's Animus form also sounds American. But despite sharing a face model, Altair and Desmond do not share a voice actor. So now we've got two Americans hooked up to the Animus. It's a very strange choice that I've spent far too much time thinking about, if they were so hung up on having an American sounding protagonist, and Altair looks like Desmond because of the animus, it would have made perfect sense for both characters to share a voice actor. I wouldn't want to hear Nolan North cracking that's what she said one-liners in the middle of the 12th century, but under a different actor, it could have been very interesting and more logically consistent to have one voice giving two radically different performances in and out of the animus. On paper, I really like the idea of these modern day sections, but the actual execution of them felt a bit half-assed. They're a good way to break up Altair's story and drip feed a little more of the sci-fi plot to the player, but when the characters are less interesting than those inside the Animus, and there's little to do other than hang out with Veronica Mars, I think most players would probably feel antsy to get back into the action. If given the choice to cut these from the game completely, I definitely wouldn't. I just wanted more substance from them. Early on, I got excited when I managed to steal an access pen and read Kristen Bell's emails. There was a nice subplot within which fleshed out her character, and doing the same for Dr. Vidic provides some interesting nuggets about Abstergo and the outside world. This sort of thing slots in perfectly, and my disappointment that these emails were the only things to muck around with really soured my opinion of these segments. If every one of these interludes allowed players to quietly sneak around, read bits of lore, and gradually explore more of the facility, it would have better justified the sci-fi plot and done wonders for the game's overall pacing. Instead, you're mostly stuck listening to this one-dimensional moron. Time for more exposition, Mr. Miles! As someone with way too much free time, I like to play certain games just for the sake of better understanding the medium. There's a lot of milestone games out there which introduced brilliant, genre-defining concepts despite falling flat on their face as an overall experience. While I might not always enjoy playing through them, I still feel like beating these games gives me valuable insight into how they shape the games of today. Before starting this video, I was sure that Assassin's Creed would also fit that mould, as an ambitious but deeply flawed product that steered open world games into the modern checklist format we know today. And if you want to be objective about it, I suppose that is a fairly accurate little summary. The investigations suck, the modern segments are undercooked, parkour is often mindless, and the egregious amount of padding and repetition is enough to keep many from ever finishing it. As a game that tries to accomplish so much with so many different mechanics, it can also feel like an unfocused patchwork of the more fleshed out games it takes from. But in the face of such overwhelming ambition and creativity, 
I just can't bring myself to feel cynically about Assassin's Creed. Its many glaring issues hold back what could have been a classic, but when it's good, it's great. As a simulation of being a medieval contract killer, Assassin's Creed may leave a lot to be desired, but as a multifaceted, sci-fi, historical fiction, action-adventure game, there's nothing else like it. So while Ubisoft may have bitten off more than they could chew, I'd say Assassin's Creed 1 is still a job well done. I've heard many longtime fans say this is an entry that should be skipped, but even as someone that hasn't touched the rest of them, I can tell that's a big mistake. Despite all its gameplay quirks and shortcomings, it takes its own themes and narrative very seriously, and I just can't imagine jumping right into any of the sequels without understanding the philosophical context this game works so hard to provide. Ultimately, I'm very glad to have played Assassin's Creed, and the world and atmosphere of Altair's adventure has lingered in my mind much longer than I expected it to. It didn't convert me into a franchise superfan or change my mind on Ubisoft's open world format, but it did inspire me to grab that sequel everyone loves so much. And that's a video for another day. In a time where Assassin's Creed has developed such a negative reputation, I'm glad I went into the original with an open mind and a willingness to be proven wrong. It can be so easy for forums or comment sections to create opinions for you on games you've never even played. Like any other dummy, I'm certainly guilty of this too. But enjoying a game so far out of my wheelhouse has got me reconsidering all the other titles I've written off without trying. You just never know until you play. But all it takes to find out is one small leap of faith. <laughs>